Hi guys, welcome back to my channel, Do More, which is all about entrepreneurship, investment, and basically being the best version of yourself that you can be. Now, my, my guest today is a very well-respected corporate personality named uh, Tansri uh, Asman Mokhtar. Now, he headed over the course of nearly two decades uh, Kazana National, Malaysia's top sovereign wealth fund, uh, building huge wealth for the country uh, over the course of that period, and uh, of course, building a lot of regional champions abroad and uh, building Malaysia's name in, in the region. Now, over the course of the couple of hours that we spent recording this podcast, we spanned our conversation, uh, Tansri Asman's career in finance, his career at Kazana National. We talked about how finance and how we regard the world of banking uh, is it's changing fast over the course of, um, as we go deeper into the 21st century. Now, of course, we also talked about life. We talked about leadership. We talked about love. And of course, uh, Malaysia's role in the world that is dominated by you know big superpowers like China and the US. And of course, we also talked about this not small matter of his trip around the world in 77 days uh, on 77 trains. Now, you know, Tansri Azman, of course, is a man for all seasons and a real asset to Malaysia. I just wish there were more of him to go around. So I hope you like this podcast. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did recording it and talking to one of Malaysia's most distinguished corporate personalities. And if you did really enjoy it, please do give me a like, uh, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel, and tell me what you think in the comments below. Stay safe, take good care of yourself, and see you soon. Hi, Tansri. Such a pleasure to see you, and thank you for doing this. It's a real honor and a privilege to be chatting with you. Uh, I, I, I hear you've been keeping busy. You tell me that you've been archiving your thoughts. You've, um, you've been traveling the world. You've been writing. Uh, you in, uh, in fact, you've been around the world uh, by train, which we'll talk about later. 77 days uh, in 77 trains. You've even attained a few roles in, in distinguished, uh, certain ac uh, distinguished academia. Um, so I guess um, let's start with asking you how you've been, because it's almost three years to the day. In fact, slightly more than three years since you left Kazana. So do, do you miss corporate life? How are you? Yeah, thank you, Chuang. Uh, happy and uh, to, and honored to be on your podcast. So I think we've been trying to do this for several months, but we've been in lockdown, right? So, uh, you know, I don't normally have these microphones here. I think this is uh, Chuang's doing. Uh. So yeah, thank you for having me. I'm uh, I've I've been well. Yeah, it's actually been almost three years since uh, I left the corporate world. Uh, at the end of July 2018, so this is almost the end of July, three years later, right? So first of all, do I miss it? Uh, yes and no. I think you know, sometimes yes, but I think by and large, no. I also checked uh, the KLCI, actually, since I left. Uh, I don't think I miss that much, la, to be honest. If you judge by um, when I left, I think it was about 1750 uh, uh, today is about 1,500 or, or slightly more, right? So it's down about 15%. Of course, that's not the only indicator. Uh, but very quickly, la, as you said, uh, in that three years, actually, about half of that has been under lockdown. So I've been back home, uh, which was the right decision because before that, I was spending about half a year in the UK, especially where I was doing a couple of fellowships at my uh, my old university uh, at Cambridge. I was a visiting fellow. So I was doing a bit of research, a bit of teaching, a bit of uh, learning myself, and indeed lots of travel. So in that first year and a half, I think at the most only about a third, I was back home uh, in Malaysia, right? So uh, since then, I've been uh, home, and over the last year or so I have been taking up uh, quite a few roles in public service, in education, in uh, uh, you know, Mercy Malaysia, for example, I'm on the board, uh, which is really about uh, social services. Uh, I'm chairing university technology. I'm on the board of INSEAF, the Islamic Finance University. I'm on several uh, national councils that the current, well, the government appointed. Eh? To, to help out on a few things. Uh, plus some commercial ventures that like we can talk about later. 
yeah, um, so many roles, so much to get into, but we agreed to do this in three parts. So I guess the first part is really, um, you know, your journey as a finance professional. And, uh, you know, obviously finance since the global financial crisis has changed a considerable amount. Um, and that's your key area. That's, that's your interest uh, in your research. I think you would look at finance from a development perspective, especially as we live in an emerging market like Malaysia. In fact, that's what you also taught when you were visit- visiting at Cambridge. Um, so just in your opinion, Tanshri, from, from your perspective as former head of a sovereign wealth fund with Kazana, 14, 15 years, um, h- how is finance changing? How is it evolving? And how should professionals you know, accommodate themselves in this new future? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm not sure. Where, I think I've made available to Chuang uh, a particular presentation I made about roughly about six, seven months ago. Uh, it was uh, CIMB Securities lah, in their partnership with CGS, right? So they invited me to talk to finance professionals. So I believe more than 100 finance professionals, people in investment attended and basically asking about, you know, where, where finance is going and, you know, with a particular emphasis on our local market. But also they wanted to hear about, you know, as a finance professional, right? So we, we've gone through the journey, right? For me, for about uh, as long as 40 years, you know, so uh, I would place it from the time, you know, you make a choice in your life, in your, uh, where, where, what you do, did in university. Uh, in fact, I didn't go to university, I did ACCA, right? So I chose to be an accountant or rather that's how I ended up. And, you know, your path in finance really started for me about 40 years ago. And uh, both the world and finance actually has changed in that 40 years. So along the way, of course, I've worked for not just for Kazana, but before that in the capital markets, I was head of research at both Solomon Smith Bunny uh, during the 98 crisis period. right? And before that, I was head of research at UBS Malaysia uh, during the boom years until about 95, 96, 97. Right? So, so you've seen how this evolved, but by and large, uh, I think it's fair to say the 30, 40 years has seen the importance of finance has, has risen so much that, that in fact, financialization, that means you see the impact of finance in practically everything, right? So, so to the point that uh, the role of banks, and we saw this during the global financial crisis, the Lehman crisis, uh, that finance really reaches so many parts of the economy uh, to the point where I think it's no longer a, a, a minority view. La. The people are concerned that uh, finance is supposed to serve the real economy and the real economy is then supposed to serve uh, society as a whole. Eh? Uh, there's an argument that this has been reversed somewhat. So, for example, if you take, uh, and this was relatively early, right, when... Um, you know, how much do banks make on proprietary trading on, say, oil, uh, oil futures, for example, right? Uh, there was a time when oil went up to above 100 US dollars per barrel. In fact, I think Goldman was calling 150 or 200 or thereabouts. And I think during that time, uh, speculation on oil was going up, uh, you know, to the point that profits made from them were, and certainly trading were higher than trading of the real thing. Uh, that even the likes of Aramco, etc., you know, may not have been earning as much as uh, the financial, the financiers and the financial speculators, right? So at one level, that's fine. I mean, speculation is good to, to an extent. But at another level, what that, that, that does is that it affects society because, you know, oil is an essential item. Diesel prices go up. And many, uh, many population cannot handle that, right? And typically, the government will put price controls of governments around the world. But then, then governments' balance sheets cannot handle it because the subsidy will be too high. But it's not just that. This spills over, say, into the, the, uh, the food sector because uh, biofuels, for example, right? So some people, uh, you know, Jetropa and so on, you know, you, you use... Uh, an alternative instead of going to food, this thing uh, can become f- uh, fuel, right? So become biofuels. So so when when fuel price goes up, biofuel price goes up, the food price goes up, and and then you start a whole spiral, right? So people in Mexico, for example, 
you know, instead of eating, I don't know, four tortillas a day, had to eat two. And people in Pakistan, instead of eating, I don't know, three chapatis a meal, had to cut down by half. You know, this was really happening, right? And you can you can multiply that all over the place. So therefore, part of the pushback has come, I think, after the 2008 crisis. Uh, what you see today, I think, is everywhere, right? The ESG movement. It's not a new one, but it has really picked up the last two, three years. Uh, in in a very major way, right? Today is front and center. The whole ESG movement, as you know, we can talk a bit more about that. But I think partly in response to where finance has gone, like it's gone too far to the point that I think it has lost its way a bit, or not a bit, lah, somewhat in terms of serving society through serving the real economy. Lah. Sorry, eh? a bit of a long explanation, but that's that's basically I I just summarized what I've been I've been I've been studying about and teaching about actually. Yeah, um, what you said is very true, Tantri, and, and some might suggest that um, the lessons that should have been learned in 2008 and 2009 were not learned um, because we seem to be making the same mistakes again, what with financial markets at record highs. And the biggest casualty is, of course, the ordinary guy because the, the wealth divide, the, the divide between the rich and the poor has never been wider. And it's not just in Malaysia, it's in America, it's all over the world. Um, so this comes at a time when there's a lot of young people soul searching. COVID has caused them to, you know, to reach deep within their selves and ask themselves what it is that they want to do. That's why a lot of, I guess, a lot of smart people are going into startups and into, you know, in in fintech, for example, they're going to the environment, uh, social entrepreneurs. Um, if you were to dispense some advice, Tansri, to the budding financial um, practitioner, what would it be? Yeah, I think the the you know the, to 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 pick up from from where we we last covered on finance just now. So financialization results or finance results in this financialization in the first place, right? So 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 you could argue there's misallocation of capital and so on and so forth. But what that does is what you've just described, which is the issue of inequality. Like, again. This was not front and center until about maybe, I suppose, 10 years ago. The French economist Thomas Piketty, as you know, wrote, wrote a, a famous book on capital, eh? a bit of a take on uh, Karl Marx's Das Kapital, uh, 100 years earlier or thereabouts. So, so I think, if you think about it, one, one of the consequences of too much financialization is basically money has become uh, so prevalent because of the unusual uh, monetary policy of, you know, essentially what they call quantitative easing, or some call quite simply printing of money, lah, more or less, eh? fiat money. Uh, what that does, of course, as you know, when there's too much supply or something, is the price drops, lah. So interest rates drop to record low or even negative real interest rates. Uh, when that happens, actually, as you know, in finance, there's an inverse relationship, right? Uh, interest rates drop, capital value goes up. So capital values, that's why it has gone up so much. And therefore, it, it, it benefits those with capital. You know, uh, and this plays its way out into the capital markets, i.e. i.e. stocks mostly and, and bonds as well. But also, another financial uh, asset is really, has become a financial asset, is, is housing. And when housing goes up you know, much faster than wage income, uh, this actually squeezes those with no capital or just about to enter the capital ladder or the property ladder, i.e. younger people. And when you combine all this is happening, asset price inflation at a time when uh, real economic growth is, is slow, right? So this kind of a slow, and you got the impact of technology, which often puts pressure on jobs because of automation and, and, and that kind of a pro pro productivity gains, right? Through machines. Uh, AI and so on and so forth. So you combine that, you actually get inequality. You got pressure on employment, and in particular, and you get you know the youth who are struggling uh, to get jobs. And even when they get jobs, their wage growth is below capital growth and housing price growth. That's why you're seeing the phenomenon not just in Malaysia but all over the world today. Uh, that uh, you know uh, is very difficult for that generation actually. And, and it's tough. I, I must say it's tough. Uh, on the other hand, yes, I think one route is actually to break away from the, the wage uh, kind of a conundrum that you are, you are 
you know, in in the divide or the surplus between labor and capital, labor gets a raw deal lah. They they get less, right? So so labor growth, uh, wage growth maybe four five percent at best, whereas capital growth is maybe double or treble of that, right? Um, in some places higher. So one way is indeed to be an entrepreneur to go into to try to do startups, etc. But as you know, the startup eco it really depends on the ecosystem where you are. It really matters. Eh? Uh, many are trying. Uh, I think, yeah, that there's good examples of success, etc. Uh, but there's also a trend in technology, as you know, that that there is a concentration of power and a concentration into, uh, and this this concentration trend is not just in technology, like in practically every sector, uh, this is happening. Eh? That that uh, that the big firms become even bigger, lah. So in in tech, there is now, of course, big tech. And uh, but in a way, you know, if you if you do a startup, indeed, part of your path uh, to success is not to become necessarily to become big tech, but grow big and uh, big enough or interesting enough that you may get acquired by one of the big techs uh, in future, right? And and many have gone down this road. I think that's the way to do it. So, you know, definitely. Well. There's obvious repercussions on the labor market because if everybody turns into becoming an entrepreneur, then who's going to work in the startups and who's going to work in the organizations? That's one repercussion as well. But um, some would suggest that low interest rates and zero interest rates that we're seeing in the Western world for many, many years is very hard to reverse because it's almost like a drug. Um, Japan went through 20, 30 years of a lost, uh, in fact, one and a half generations now. They have not been able to raise interest rates at all because growth has been so bad. Um, we, we see the Federal Reserve has been, has been trying to raise rates for many, many times over the last few years to no avail. Um, is, 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 is there any way to come out of this low interest rate regime without a lot of pain? And can it be done? Because it's politically unfeasible, Tan Sri, isn't it? Uh, yes, I think the so-called exit strategy from a, from a low or even negative interest rate policy is a very difficult one, right? In fact, they've been talking about this for for quite a while. Certainly, from the the the, the global financial crisis of of uh, 2008, right? Uh, but with very little success. In fact, the money creation uh, actually increased, especially the last two three years, right? So you look at the Fed balance sheet. I, I can't remember how much, but you know, many trillions. Like you're talking about 25, 30 percent increase in in just the last couple of years. So. It is a drug. It is steroids. So how do you win yourself out of it? Uh, I don't have a short answer. And I'm, I know many, many clever people are trying to think it through. Uh, so, so it is a kind of a you know, trap in a way that is very difficult to get out of. But um, I don't know. Historically, from what I can, from my readings and from what I can tell, that's why, uh, you know, sorry, before that, there's a lot of talk about, you may have heard about modern uh, uh, monetary theory, right? MMT, which basically says that it doesn't matter, you print money, you continue, you spend it, uh, and so on. I think that argument is quite attractive, but I think that only works when you're the world reserve currency. Lah. Because you know, if you're, if you're the world's reserve currency, you continue printing, people still have some faith in the, in the, in the greenback, in the US dollar, right? But you try doing that, if you are a country like ours, or or Thailand and so on and so forth, you know, uh, in short order, the the currency speculators will attack your currency, lah. In history, actually, uh, those who do uh, fiscal looseness, i.e., they they you know monetary looseness, they they continue printing money. Eventually, either inflation sets in or the basement of the currency sets in, right? Eventually, but that eventually can take a long time, lah. You know, you're talking decades and so on, and usually it links to some weakening of your own political or geopolitical uh, uh, status. For example, you know there was a time when the pound sterling was was the uh, the, the the world's reserve currency, right? And but after Second World War, when the war cost Britain a lot of money, uh, their empire was shrinking, and a lot of their profit centers were therefore being plucked out. Uh, and then it was the Suez, uh, I think it was the Suez crisis, like, which basically was sometime in the 50s when uh, Gen- when Nasser uh, of Egypt nationalized the Suez Canal, right? So that, and then Britain couldn't do anything and, and really 
people realize that the the empire had little clothes left lah so to speak so then the really sterling decline and no longer and then the US dollar took over but but that took you know the decline of the british empire was really happening for for decades right but it took quite a long time before that debasement finally happened and and by the 70s you know uk had to go you know uh, hand in what they call it the cap in hand to to the imf eh? asking for a bailout package can you imagine that so so those are some of the big trends and you know no country on earth apart from maybe north korea maybe iran who are sanctioned away get are totally insulated from this monetary trend right because because the world is an open economy and malaysia is the same uh, so it's not it's tough lah because in that environment you know the few things i think we can and should do is you know concentrate more on the real economy i think the financial markets are just one indicator but you can see that if you pay too much attention to the capital economy and you don't pay enough attention to the real economy and the people's economy uh, this is a recipe that you'll be out of sync lah, and you will not get you know social cohesion etc so this is this is one important lesson so in spite you know so so don't look too much about frankly even like times like this about rating agencies uh, you know they matter but but you know you 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 your indicators actually is is maybe the how you measure whether how well you're doing or not well you know you should look at other you know human indicators the the real economy for example rather than just the so called capital economy yeah, I, I'm not sure whether the politics of our country will allow this, but it, it's an opportunity, right, to upheave and to transform the economy. Um, and, you know, obviously people like Keas Jomo, the, the economist, has this call for radical reform. For example, this preoccupation with foreign direct investment is something which he's always been uh, quite um, skeptical of. Um, do you think there's room for Malaysia to go on a different path, um, to perhaps look at doing things in a different way, and do you think that there's an opportunity for the current government to do this? You know, their, their troubles notwithstanding? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, Chuang, but it is true. Every crisis gives this so-called opportunity, right? Uh, you know, so I think, yes, there's definitely an, an opportunity. I mean, there's a lot of challenges. I think we highlighted some of them. But there is definitely opportunity because... Uh, for example, if in the West, uh, you know, they, they are and we should be too preoccupied on the whole carbon trans- transition, for example. So you, you, you don't just build back better, but you build back, you build green, you know, you build back and green better, right? That kind of thing, green new deal and so on and so forth. Uh, in our case, yeah, I think the, the obviously we need to do our part in terms of the you know global environmental commons that challenge right uh, we need to do our part but at the same time some of the structural issues of our country include I mean, inequality is one right so we talk about b40 uh, arguably the b40 would have expanded with the covid uh, and that's you know that's that's tough that's really tough especially you've been making progress right um the over dependence on both uh, or even obsession as what Dr. Jomo said on FDI I think it's one issue we need to be more balanced because DDI for example the direct uh, sorry domestic direct investment um, we have pools of savings right uh, which are of course managed well by the likes of EPF and others uh, to the extent that remember about 20 years ago we were uh, or is it almost 30 years ago now in the early 90s what was one major need of the country at that time? We, we needed uh, infrastructure, for example. We needed you know, new airport, highways. So we were able to innovate as a country to mobilize those pools of savings uh, into public infrastructure, right? Of course, there was a privatization process in between. Some worked, some didn't work. Uh, you know, MRT systems, etc., right? So, so we created the public, uh, the private debt securities market uh, initially bonds and then the sukuk market we started at five years seven years ten years now you can comfortably get 21 30 years right uh, so so can we convert this into productive uh, di- direct investment that create jobs you know in sectors that that can earn 
foreign exchange actually you know whether tourism for example or improve in manufacturing or indeed uh, part of the whole uh, digital uh, e-commerce produce that you can you can link you know the the real economy into the digital economy etc so so we can talk a bit on specific so so my my first thought is that yes you know of course all that uh, in some places they call it industrial policy you need a lot of coordination uh, you need you need the vision you need you need the leadership you need you know the policy continuity lah, which which suggests uh, you know, not really my area, but obviously from an economic and financial standpoint, you need political stability and policy continuity to do all that. Lah. So we hope that part of the equation, which is actually a critical part, gets sorted out. Lah, right? Uh, the second one, Chuang, is probably worth highlighting is the over-dependence, not just on foreign direct investment, but on overseas foreign workers. Eh? I think this, this crisis has, uh, the COVID crisis has highlighted this the proverbial chicken has really, you know, come home to roost. I suppose, um, you know, supposedly there's about seven million of which only about half are of official. So that's probably too many. So we have to wean ourselves off, lah, because it does many things, lah. You know, one, one is the 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 burden on uh, on uh, on on the overall social infrastructure as we as we're seeing today right uh, you know that you know in this case public health but it's not just public health so all kinds of social infrastructure burden but but more important importantly is actually the issue of you know there is wage suppression that is happening in the economy uh, arguably not all but many of those jobs you know if if they were better paying jobs this can be taken up by by the locals right uh, so, for example, they say if you go to Los Angeles, you go to a cafe or a nice restaurant, right? Uh, there are no waiters. Those guys and ladies and girls who are serving you, they are actually uh, actresses or script writers or film directors in future. They just happen to be waiting tables right now, right? Because, because you know, uh, any customer-facing job actually gives you a chance to, to, to show what you can do, to, to impress people and that's what happened uh, I mean as a student I, I used to work in restaurants before for extra income you know and, and, and I'm glad I did because you know there's nothing like being customer facing and serving a skinhead in, 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 in England at at 11pm uh, when the pubs close and the guy wants you know oi I want a burger you know and you are sitting down there and this guy is looking down at you because uh, you learn very fast la, on your feet, right? So, so our guys got to got to pick up the slack, lah. You know, we, we must take on this. Uh, you know, be be adventurous. Uh, I came into the job market in the mid '80s when I first came back as a as a young accountant. I, I was lucky; I had a job in uh, LLN, Tenaga, lah. That time, cause I was a scholar, right? So I served my bond. But some of my friends got no job. They work jual uh, ayam percik, you know, at pasar malam all this. They're all successful entrepreneurs now. So for me, maybe that was a trap. Had I gone out, I, I would have become, you know, chances are any. So, so really, entrepreneurship is one route, but also the route of, I think, national kind of labor reforms. I think we, we need to look at this. And I will even go so far to, to make the point that perhaps the minimum wage, for example, is too low. I think we should, once we should consider making it into you know what, I think Ben Nagara has an indicator called the living wage, eh? which is significantly higher than the minimum wage. Of course, this is going to be more cost to the to the corporates, right? But as you know, under ESG, the corporates uh, have been flagged out. Overseas now, it's, it's a bit very awkward. Lah. We're reading about uh, what they call modern slavery. Eh? And Malaysia has been highlighted as one of the places where this is happening whether in the manufacturing sector or the plantation sector or construction sector. Another impact of this would be actually it gives the opportunity for our companies to innovate, right? Because at the moment, there's little incentive to innovate when you, you are, you're stuck on the drug of cheap labor, actually. So the time has come, and this has been going on for quite a long time. I think the time has come. Uh, and, and this is, in a way... It's not a tax per se on on uh, because taxation is another another route uh, that some people are talking about, whether windfall tax etc. Uh, you know that's that's a related but separate topic. But if you think about it, uh, this is actually not a tax, but it's actually a wealth transfer from capital to labor. 
And when money goes to the lower income group, guess what? You have a super super powered turbo charge uh, lever into the economy because of the propensity to spend is very high. You know, when you are lower income, you you give uh, they they get more money. You know what they deserve. Uh, productivity, of course, we, we have to consider within this whole thing, right? Is chances are for every dollar they get, a lot of it is going to find its way into the economy, and the multiplier effect is going to be high. As opposed to you know, rich guy or rich lady gets yet another dividend check, they just bank it in. It will just probably sit down there and earn one and a half percent FD rates or whatever lah. So, so, so those are a couple of ideas, I suppose. But lab, I think labor market reforms, how we look at, uh, because FDI, as you know, there's been a race to the bottom. Lah. People have been, you know, Philippines offer for BPO, and then Malaysia you know, challenge, and then Thailand does this. That, that. Then in the end, actually the host country, I think studies have shown, the impact can be a bit limited. Eh? Uh, it's good lah. You you create certain jobs, but sometimes the jobs are also you know a bit suppressed. So that's where even if you start you know I think a serious study should be done looking at minimum wage to go into living wage, for example. Well, the thing is, um, quite fortuitously, um, you've recently been appointed one of eight professionals to uh, to join this National Recovery Council by the government, and that's interesting because um, you have been part of the. 10 year, at least 10 year transformation agenda for the government linked companies. And maybe, and some people suggest that the GLCs and the GLICs, which is the government linked investment companies, there's a role for them to play in forging this new path. And what a better time than now, when obviously, you know, you know out of this chaos can come some order. Yeah, I think, I think the, yeah, I think there's several things there, Chuang. I think, first of all, the, the National Recovery Council, yeah, I think, you know, uh, frankly, I was a bit surprised, but since since I've been called, I said, okay, let, let's see what, you know, of course, I'll try my best, uh, you know, at a time of national emergency, uh, but also to, to, to be clear, you know, uh, exactly what is the role, etc. cetera, we, we'll need to see, but inshallah, I'll try my best. Uh, maybe just a brief word on the, the whole recovery process. I think, you know, it's been charted out somewhat, uh, obviously, the, the way I'm trying to frame and think about this is, I would say there are three uh, recoveries that we need to manage, lah. you know, three timelines, right, in, in my view at least. Uh, the first two is obvious and the third one is not so obvious or rather is there, but it's certainly related. So the first two is in the short term, let's say within 12, 18 months is really the, the recovery from the virus, lah, you know, the public health challenge, right? Uh, there are all kinds of medical experts, epidemiologists, people in the, and you know the vaccination program. So this is not really my area. Of course, it is related. The second one is around economic recovery, which is perhaps concurrently is on a say a three to five year period. Like we really need to grab this chance. I think the, the there are they they obviously related lives and livelihoods and so on and so forth. Uh, but, you know, in the priority to me, the public health challenge takes precedence. Right? We have to solve that and we will solve that through vaccination and through discipline in uh, managing the lockdown and some cleverness in terms of being surgical about where to lock down, where not to lock down, when to test, when to trace, etc., etc. But obviously discipline, no double standards, etc. Right? All these things must, must apply. Uh, in so far as the economic recovery, yeah, we talk about some of that. You know, so new investments, new types of investments, job creation, uh, reforming, you know, labor uh, markets, and then you know, concentrating on certain uh, growth areas, right? Whether uh, you know, whether for example, uh, the whole green economy, uh, whether uh, food and agriculture, for example. You know, food tech, you know, now I think there's more consciousness on food security, on traceability, health, and so on and so forth, right? And I suppose during during the COVID crisis, also suddenly, you know, people are discovering that, uh, you know, they can actually bake stuff or plant vegetables. Of course, these are all micro scale, but some are turning this into businesses, right? Which I think is interesting. Uh, but the third one is, the third horizon, I think is just as important. Of course, this will need uh, both political will and societal will to execute, which are the longer term, 
uh, challenges in term of structural reforms that the country needs lah. You know, from political reforms to how the country is governed, to the issue of NEP, to the issue of education, vernacular schools. You know, these are all important things of us as Bangsa Malaysia, like if we really want to get ahead. Uh, because otherwise, I think the stability of the country that the economy and social services like health needs to be built on will not be stable. I think this is the key point. And, you know, others like, um, you know, my friend Datuk Nazir Razak, for example, has been calling for a National Consultative Council, which I think is a good idea. You know, I've, I've given my views to that project, the Better Malaysia project, which is, you know, to, to, to have a deliberative council to think through uh, the kind of structural reforms the country needs. And by the way, it's not the first time we're doing it. Eh? As you know, the original NCC was after the 69 riots. And then later, when Dr. Mahathir did the NDP, I think he did an, another kind of a, a consultative council, right? Uh, but to do that, of course, you need you need uh, some degree of goodwill and trust, lah. That that people, you know, the social capital to do that, which I think we we can get there. Uh, on the role of Gleeks and GLC, sure. You know, as I said, Gleeks, you know, they 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 are by and large well managed. Thank God for that. Uh, you could argue they should be more adventurous, etc. On the other hand, I'm now a semi-retired pensioner. I want them to not to take too much risk with my my pension, right? Which is good. On the other hand, you know, different horses for different courses. My old shop, Kazana, was always, you know, a kind of a risk taker on behalf of the the government. You know, in many ways. And indeed, after zero nine, uh, we did a whole bunch of stuff at that time, lah. Uh, to try and <clears throat> and trigger the whole uh, domestic investment process, right? So investments in places like Iskandar, into sectors like creative industry, into life sciences, into technology. I think these are the kind of risky or theme parks or building up a tourism base eh, to, to, you know, Desaru, etc. So this was actually done about 10, 12 years ago, which I'm sure the uh, perhaps the new CEO at Kazana, uh, I don't know, but that could be part of his mandate. But certainly... You need instruments to convert some of those uh, savings uh, into into you know the kind of productive investments that also creates jobs, right, and create good jobs into the real economy. Uh, to do that, you need money, but you also need management skills and and a policy framework to allow that, lah. So so in in economic you know jargon, I suppose this is called industrial policy, which is actually back with a bang, you know, uh, certainly after COVID, Joe Biden's uh, 1.9 trillion program is essentially one big industrial policy, yeah? his investment program. And uh, and you see uh, economists like Maria Matsukato, I think you may have heard, she talks about the mission-based economy, etc. So it's back in fashion and rightly so, la. I think it shouldn't have left in the first place. So yeah, those are some thoughts, John. Yeah, um, I, I just couldn't help but notice that some of the things that you talked about, some of the social policies that need to be dismantled, whether it's the NEP or whether it's the education system or whether it's some of those monoliths which have been around a long time, you know, it is things that which have been, well, obviously, which has held the country back uh, domestically, but also it's been looked upon with some disdain by people like foreign fund managers and ratings agencies and, of course, people like the World Bank. They've made comments on that in the past and, you know, quite rightly so as well. The thing is, they're very, very big decisions to make. There's big political repercussions from doing so. And there'll be months, if not years, of social friction as a result of that because we've had nearly 50 years of those policies. So how are we going to push those through? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, to clarify so that I'm not misunderstood, Chuang, um, I'm not necessarily saying dismantle because dismantle is a big word. First of all, it's not up to me. La. It's, it's basically, it should reflect both, you know, what society wants and needs, uh, as well as, of course, we, we should be anchored on, you know, certain values and principles of, you know, natural fairness, etc. And, of course, we have our national, cons you know, our Malaysian constitution, etc., etc., right? Uh, but you know, to understand, for example, we we uh, we are a nation that will turn sixty four next month, sixty fourth uh, Merdeka, right? So sixty four years old is for a person is quite old, lah. In fact, 
somebody told me what the Beatles made a song about uh, being 64, right? Remember? I'm 64. When I'm 64. Yeah, so, right. but for country, 64 yeah. is not that old, lah. Actually, <clears throat> it's not that old. I mean, uh, you look at where America was after 64 years. I think they were still having, you know, uh, in fact, they they had not even gotten into a civil war yet. They will eventually go into civil war, etc. Right? So. So not that, not that we know uh, nothing of that sort that we hope, but in that 64 years, Chuang, I, I I reflect back and say, okay, we, we've actually overcome quite a lot of obstacles. Eh? So 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 at the time when we're doing this podcast, you know, we're wondering. I think there's a lot of uncertainty, but but let's just step back a bit and say that you know, if you look back in 57 when we became a country again, eh, this is I'm just voicing out. I was born in 61, but you know, 57 became country. You know, it wasn't easy, right? You put this together, it's post-colonial, etc. Uh, a lot of imbalances in the country at that time. Uh, then, of course, the our you know, under very unfortunate 69 riots. Then the response to that, uh, you know, but always it was not nationalization, but it was like grow, grow the pie such that you don't take from Peter to give to Paul and all that, lah. Right? So I, you know. My my parents couldn't go to university, and I was like first generation. Uh, you know, my parents were teachers, like normal normal people, etc. Right? But I found my way, and you know, was able through through NEP. Uh, but I'm proud. I think I served back my contract, etc. And I, I hope I served that back and created value and all that, lah. And and so, but you know, uh, but I think if it's been abused, for example. Or the time has come where inequality is actually color blind, right? It's not any particular race. You know, there there are a lot of um, poor uh, non Bumis as well. So anybody in power has to think about how to uplift all. You know, uh, so so instead of by race or you know how it's been perhaps you know taken up by certain groups to just say it's by race, whereas actually Tun Razak and all didn't intend it that way. Uh, You know, it should actually be by need and and by, you know, to to solve the whole inequality issue. And inequality is many things, eh? not just wealth and income, but opportunity and so on and so forth. So so that's basically what I'm trying to say. And, and indeed, when it comes to schools, of course, the vernacular school issue, you know, is is a, is a is a sensitive or even sacred issue to the Chinese community and others. And you know, I I sat on quite a few education reform panels, etc. Uh, but you know you have to balance that against unity, etc. So Singapore, for example, as you know, uh, Lee Kuan Yew's government uh, made it all into one stream, for example. Of course, there's issue of quality management, etc. So, so these are not easy issues, and certainly I'm not the guy to solve them. But I'm just highlighting that from an economic financial standpoint, we can't do uh, sustainable growth and development. Until and unless we solve this, lah, you know the kind of structural things, right? The issue of corruption, the issue of you know governance, the issue of you know how political uh, power concentration and formation is happening, right? Uh, you know, can you or should you be able to jump parties, for example? I think you know people are upset, uh, and and that that volatility actually is is very difficult. As someone said that. Um, When the political M&A market is more active than the corporate M&A market, then we are we are in trouble. Lah. What you want is a very stable politics, and then the trading and the corporate and the investment market is actually active. Lah. Then that's healthy, right? Now is the other way around. Naturally, the 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 investment side, including the foreign investor you talk about, is is uh, cautious. I think that's understandable because you you're not clear where the Where the policy and the and the political direction of the country is going, right? I think, of course, the those in in politics they they understand that, but I think that, that needs to be solved. And you would argue that even more basic is some of those issues. Actually, those are foundational issues as far as I'm concerned. So that needs reforming. Uh, I think that is that is definitely a recognition. Uh, just that you know what kind of platform, etc. I think you know. And this is perhaps as good an opportunity as anything, lah. You know, as we press the so-called proverbial reset button, right? As we go ahead, I think that's something we we need to bear in mind. 
Yeah, um, so much to unpack in what you just said, but I, I think the biggest elephant in the room is the political environment, Tanshi. Um, I, I don't know how to get you to, I, I guess, to just give an honest, candid viewpoint, but do you see... That's why I, I always keep this in my, in, my, in my room. You know what that is? That's the elephant in the room, la, but never mind. <laughs> it is so true. Do you, do you see an, any light at the end of the tunnel, Tanshi? Uh, I mean, I I have my some views naturally. Like every Malaysian will have our views on the politics, but really not my place to talk too much about it because really not my field. But you know, but any solutioning you would expect, really you need to find a frequency. Uh, you know, if if you use the analogy of a of a conversation, you you must have a, a common language or in the case of technology, a common megahertz uh, to talk, lah, right? Uh, I think judging on what's happening on the hill, the parliament hill this week, susah. Lah. You know, people are, a lot of people talking, a lot of voices, but they're all over each other or shouting at each other, then then very difficult. So, so I think it has to start with, you know, figuring out how do we begin to have those conversations again and to agree to disagree even, and the uh, civility in, t- in in terms of both, you know, how do you bring back civility into both politics and, if I may say, into civil society itself? Civil society is also is also noisy. Eh? I'm you know I'm in many groups like all of us are in 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 WhatsApp. Some you don't want to be in the group, so they put you in the group. Uh, then you just you know listen. And temperature is of course high. I think everyone's got to somehow cool down to find that frequency to talk properly. Uh, sorry lah, I, I have to talk in abstractions because you know I don't think it's right or fair for me to talk the detail. Eh? I think that's of course known. And as I said, uh, Alhamdulillah lah, thank God. I think so far, in spite of all the issues that we have, you know, again, I'm not being an apologist or anything like that, but again, eh, this is in general. You see, we don't have a culture that is... It's still relatively okay, lah. I mean, you know, I mean, of course, there's a lot of people suffering this and that, you know, that, without doubt. I mean, how civil society has come forward to help to plug the gaps, etc. Right? You know, so this is happening, and that, you know, and between the races, I think we we all quite united in that sense, lah. You know, we 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 are all unhappy about the political uncertainty, etc., and the behaviour of some of them, but by and large, I think you know the society is still coherent. That is. That is tolerance. That is understanding. By and large, eh? by and large, and and we abhor, you know, antisocial behavior by by whatever lah, by whoever, right? And I think that's something to build on, Chuang. You know that that need. Because you look at some countries, uh, that's not happening. Eh? Of course, that's why when when I can't remember was it Bloomberg who wrote about the failed state. Uh, I don't think it's a failed state lah, because failed state. You cannot, you cannot. I mean, by by many definitions, right? From Syria to let alone Yemen, or even South Africa's writing. Come on, jauh sekali again. But, but we have, to, we cannot be complacent. Obviously, right? We we need to take some. So that's why, in my mind, any national recovery, we need to think of three horizons, lah. Solve, solve the virus, right? We need to do that fast in the next 18, 12 to eighteen months. Concurrently. You know, get the economic trajectory to 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 build back better, so to speak, but build back green, build back fairer, etc. Lah, right? And there, when we talk about that a little bit just now, right? There's a few things there. But at the same time, you know, a concurrent group needs to figure out, you know, how do we press the structural reset buttons? Lah? How do we even begin to do that? I think this is something as a society we have to we have to look at that. And I think many. You know, quite a few people, you can see quite a lot of projects. Eh? The Bangsa Malaysia project, lah, the Better Malaysia project, lah, and so on. I mean, that, that's quite a few. Uh, some will be top-down, some will be bottom-up, you know, vote 18, etc. So it's good. All these are a kind of flowering of civil society. It's a little bit noisy, but that's natural. Noisy is okay, lah, as long as it's reasonably orderly and people do it, you know, with goodwill, with good intent. Uh, then, you know, Inshallah, I think if we if we if we all individually 
you know uh, you know resolve to do that properly then i think we can get on the right stream lah put it that way yeah you're right i mean tanche thankfully malaysians uh, are at heart a peaceful society and at working level and definitely at ground level we are very friendly you know we we know there's problems but we are we are we're good with each other um you know all the things that you talk about from a structural perspective that have to be addressed right Taken in the context, because we don't live in a vacuum, there's other things going on. And in your slides to CIMB, you talked about you know at least six or seven global mega trends. Too many to get into today, but I, I, you know, for example, things like China, you know, and their preponderance in this part of the world, because obviously you know ASEAN is is very close to them, closer to them than of course closer to China than we are to America. So this tussle between America and China is happening in real time, right? There's also things like the climate, which is, you know, as you can see around the world, there's been so many flare-ups, uh, floods, you know, fires, droughts. It's it's getting clearer and clearer that there's something wrong with the environment. And then of course there's the geopolitics and the uncertainty of of um, the cli- of of the unknown, whether it's COVID or the next virus. You know, let's just take China for example, at Tanjore. You know, you you've been all over the world. You've dealt with the Chinese conglomerates. You must have met senior Chinese uh, government representatives in your time at Kazana. How should Malaysians view China, friend or foe? Yeah, well, well, no, no. You you raise a very important topic. I think in my uh, speech to CIMB, which uh, I hope you can make available to to your listeners, like if they're interested, because. Uh, I mean, in this interview format, we we just you know chit chat that kind of thing, right? but that one is a bit more structured. So I highlighted about seven mega trends, right? as you said, too many to run through in detail. But certainly, geopolitics and geoeconomics, of which the Sino-American, uh, I was about to say relationship, but it's more like contestation, right? Is certainly one of them, and indeed the whole uh, climate change, environmental and uh, natural capital challenges is another one lah okay so let, let's take both uh, or one one by one rather uh, i think you're right southeast asia is uh, is definitely part of a theater within that contestation of the great powers lah so we we are witnessing in our lifetime a return of that great powers as you know uh, I think it was a Greek uh, philosopher or whatever, uh, how do you pronounce it, to listen to this or something. <laughs> he basically says whenever, whenever you know, two superpowers cross in the history of mankind, i.e. one is on the decline and one's on the, on the up, that will result in a clash of some sort, lah, right? Uh, in the old days, war. Uh, today, it could be trade wars, it could be technology wars. Uh, or, or even finance wars, right? Because the finance wars is quite interesting. Lah. So dollar, just now we talk about dollar as reserve currency. There's some challenge from the cryptos, for example. Uh, of course, still small, interesting, but small. But then, you know, China comes out with their own cryptocurrency, right? Who knows? This could be a precursor to, to something happening there. Although they've been controlling yuan as an external currency for decades now. So Southeast Asia actually is a theatre because if you think about it, uh, you know, the, the two hosts in that contestation, uh, their respective markets, <coughs> they, they build up walls to each other, lah, right? Europe, I think, was, was kind of trying to play both sides and, and naturally so because they need, they need the capital, they need the energy, uh, the likes of Italy and of course they got BRI and stuff like that. But increasingly... Uh, they are moving towards towards their their old NATO partners lah, right? Increasingly, so Southeast Asia actually. So therefore, we should be you know clever to try to be neutral. We were neutral. We we put neutrality at the heart of. In fact, it's a foundational value or principle of ASEAN, right? As you know, uh, there's that 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 uh, <laughs> memorable acronym ZOPFAN. The zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality. I think that's what a bit of a mouthful, but that became a principle uh, to ASEAN, which itself came out of part of the thinking around the non-aligned movement that Sukarno did, and uh, I think it was 1955 in Bandung, if I'm not mistaken. So, so one is: can we be neutral at a time of great power rivalry? Yeah? Uh, the answer is maybe. That's why I've been advocating. Uh, a metaphor of um, 
as you know, when ef- elephants fight, you be careful, don't get trampled. Lah. But in, in our folk tale, a legacy of this part of the world, not just Malaysia, but certainly also Indonesia, <coughs> you know the animal sang kancil, right? So kancil, the mouse deer, is a clever animal that is small, but is clever, nimble, that when, when the big, uh, you know, the big uh, elephants or crocodiles or the tigers all fight, that you are able to maneuver that you win, actually. So you don't get involved in their fight. So so that's that's the, the, the overall metaphor. So a kind of kanchil nomics is something we need to think of. What does that mean? So for example, you know, we, we should treat both China and America as a friend, if we can. There will be some instances like whether it's South China Sea or whether a particular American president comes in and tries to do a very one-sided trade agreement, for example, you know, which, uh, in my view, the TPP, the problem with the TPP, in my view, uh, now I can say, I'm outside Kazana now, was that uh, it was too one-sided. It wasn't about free trade. You know, I said, yeah, we were all for free trade, but it must be fair trade as well. Uh, It was actually perhaps targeted at certain countries in the region, but we, we were collateral damage, right? In the end, the American people rejected that deal too. It, ironically, because it was too one-sided, probably in favor not of Americans, but certain American corporations. You know, people were losing jobs, etc. Right. So both uh, Trump for sure, but Hillary Clinton was also eventually had to back down. Uh, it was during the Obama time. But anyway, so 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 in the case of China, for example, if some of the BRI deals were too one-sided, for example, ECRL is good. I think the, the Dr. Mahathir's government went back and pushed back and renegotiated. Not, not many countries were willing to do that, eh? from, from Sri Lanka to Pakistan to other places. I think it's good. And frankly, for my Chinese friends, they should know that if they do one-sided deals, eventually this thing will come back to bite them. It's not, it's not going to do them any good, whether in Southeast Asia or in Africa or anywhere. But I think we are primed, actually, and so is Indonesia, so is Thailand, uh, to capture the consequence of this great power rivalry, actually. I think this is certainly should be part of our uh, rebuilding program. Eh? Uh, of course, we may have a dilemma Then what happens if, uh, if South China Sea, there are skirmishes or they, you know, people come into our waters, etc. I think this is about national sovereignty, etc. Right? We have to defend that. I think that part is somehow the balance that we, we need to find. Like, and that's where diplomacy and... Uh, you know, clear thinking, clear preparedness, etc. Which I think, I think we can achieve that, and and we've done that before, right? So during the Cold War, kind of rivalry, right? So so the so-called domino theory, lah. I don't know whether you remember Chong, because people were fearing if Vietnam falls, and then what happens? The rest of Southeast Asia, and actually there was a communist insurgency in our. Uh, that's one of the challenges that we overcame in the sixty-four years, right? But we found a way. And, and again, this starts with actually some form of national solidarity. Like if you're not strong domestically, then yeah, you, could, you, you cannot play this. To, be, to play the, the, the so-called uh, good kanchil nomics, you must be strong kanchil in the first place, like put it that way. So yeah, I you know, hope that makes some sense. No, it does. Um, so obviously I can't help but consider what it takes to, to, to coalesce all those different ideas into a peaceable one which works for the country. Um, do we need an administration and leaders who are more democratic in nature? Um, do we need a leadership and administration which is more dictatorial in nature? For example, Kuan Yew of, of Singapore might have done a good job of c- controlling both power um, divides. Uh, maybe Tun Mahathir as well would have done a, a good job. But we don't have those leaders I- in this country anymore, not, not at least uh, visibly. Um, in your opinion, what kind of administration do we need um, to, to, to traverse these two giants that are fighting in our backyard, firstly? And, and secondly, um, um, how much pain must we go through before we get to that point? Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, the, the you know, people who, who are experts and, you know, they commented on these matters about leadership, political leadership, political systems. Again, eh, I, I'm just uh, putting a caveat, not not my field per se. However, of course, you know, I, I, I look from uh, economic and financial lens that I think quite clearly that the, 
uh, there's a commentary saying that at times of great uncertainty and volatility around the world, which is happening in finance, in climate, in society, right, inequality, etc., right, technology actually increases that that kind of a uh, uh, amplitude and volatility. People look for certain strength and, and certainty, and therefore people seem to be voting strong men, lah, mostly men, right? <laughs> From you know, uh, you know, Modi in India or Erdogan in Turkey. Before that, we had Donald Trump in in the White House, uh, Victor Orban in Hungary, Duterte in the uh, Philippines, or indeed President Xi in uh, in China. Uh, interestingly, they're all men, right? And yet, when you do surveys of who are successful heads of state or, or people that we kind of admire, who inspire us, they're mostly ladies. Eh? <laughs> From New Zealand, who's amazing. Of course, people can say small country, but you just look at Germany. I'm a, I'm an admirer of Angela Merkel, what she has done. You know, she's she's amazing, and uh, you know, very principled. Uh, you know, effective. This one, no no nonsense, right? Very humble. Uh, I think she's a clergyman, uh, clergyman's uh, daughter, uh, this one, uh, and so on, right? So, so I think leadership, whether you know more autocratic, more concentrated power or less, I'm not convinced by by that argument to have that, right? Number one, because uh, you know, in fact, as as a famous uh, Chinese leader said, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white as long as it catches the rat, right? So I think the only ism we should be following is actually pragmatism. La. Of course, pragmatism means you solve the problem, but based on certain, you know, uh, values and principles, la, you know, uh, you know, it, it must be fair, etc. So on balance, I would say, obviously, we, we, we should move away. And in any case, the times doesn't allow it anymore. I think you, you have to open up even Singapore is opening up. I think they've been successful at what they do, but I think they understand that you have to open up, whether it's social media or younger generation, or indeed it's the right thing to do. But there must be checks and balance in the system. So I would say a blended you know, system that, that you, you have both you know, order, uh, but yet <clears throat> you have room, freedom of thought that people can do things and freedom... And and freedoms lah, but not unfettered freedoms lah. You know, I'm you know we we need certain order. So, so I think we have a tradition of achieving that balance. You know, between uh, a more centralized need as well as a more freer and distributed, but within our own cultural norms and so on and so forth, lah, Chuang. So I think, yeah. But but as I said lah, that is in the realm of not the short or medium term restructuring. I think we, we need to figure out this on our journey. I think by the time we get to be, I don't know, 75 years old as a country or something like that, so 10, 11 year horizon, it's maybe, you know, this is that generation that, that um, you know, those who are in their 30s, 40s, uh, perhaps 50s, I think it's, it's it, I think, of course, the older, I, I, I just turned 60, so I'm probably in the, in that slightly older generation. I think, you know, we, we should share whatever experience that is hopefully useful. But that generation now coming through, I think we'll need to build that. And not just us, I think all over the world, people are trying to find that, that balance. And I would just make one other point, which is the countries that can get those configurations together, if you can get your act together, the rewards in the global system now is disproportionately higher. So for example, there's a lot of capital out there there's a lot of liquidity. So they're all trying to find. So if country A does, it doesn't actually have to do an absolutely perfect job. If it does a relatively good job relative to the next guy, the money will come. We, we, we understand that, right? So, so, you know, so, so this is actually the price. And, 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 and while we're doing it, the contestation of the superpowers or even ideological systems, we should, in my view, be wary and cover our own more. We, 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 you know, we, we have to engage naturally, but you know, statesmanship or, 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 or uh, what do you call it, statecraft, if you can, can call it that, is the ability to how to harness all these things and create your own mold, maintain some kind of you know, your own sovereignty, but yet you know, be engaged with the world and, and do that ultimately, actually, what, what is the right thing to do? As I said just now, just like finance, 
uh, finance is supposed to serve the real economy, serve society lah. So it's politics actually. You should be serving, <laughs> serving the ultimately society lah and the people. And and you know if we can do that, then you know great future ahead. I know there's a lot, there's a lot, but you know when you have a big problem, you break it up into smaller problems lah, and then and then try to solve them. Yeah. So even while this all this financialization is going on, uh, the the markets don't sleep. They, they're they're trading twenty four seven on this on the cycle. And as we speak, I mean, this is your realm of expertise here, Tantri. Um, I I just want to get your view on the next say ten years in financial markets because obviously, as you say, ASEAN and Malaysia are in the doldrums because. Of, of our own respective problems and China has got its clamp down from a regulatory perspective on its technology companies and America is at an all-time high it continues to chart new record highs a lot of this is due to the surplus capital as you were saying in the, in the system Tanjiri how do you see markets in the next 10 years do you see a transition to cryptocurrencies do you see um, a, a fleeing of capital from, from traditional markets like fixed income and, and equities into the new currencies into the new crypto markets um, how should investors position their portfolios in the next 10 years? Um, you know, these big macro issues, which I think a lot of people are grappling with, not just at an individual level, but also at institutional level. I see more and more money being put into Ethereum and Bitcoin and, and what have you, into these new things like and, um, non-fungible tokens. And um, I just want to get your point of view. What, how do you see the things, markets unfolding in the next 10 years? Yeah, well, I don't know. 10 years is quite a long time, um, Chong, because... As you know, markets these days, the focus on short termism is even more day trading, etc. Yeah, first of all, you 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 talk a lot just now about cryptos. So cryptos is interesting because you know at first we get enamored by the underlying technology, right? Blockchain. Of course, blockchain is just the enabling technology, interesting one at that, powerful. Uh, but then you get excited by the fact that uh, in theory, cryptos with a finite amount. Uh, you know, Bitcoin being the first and then later many came. Uh, actually, in theory, imposes certain discipline on how much supply of that particular uh, asset class comes into the market, right? In theory, right? Unlike, you know, we were all worried around this time around the kind of fiat money, money printing being done by central banks. Uh, the problem with that is the price then is not anchored on anything solid. So it's still open to lots of speculation by real money coming out from the printing presses of central banks around the world. So as a result, you, you have an instrument that, that is interesting with very interesting enabling technology. In theory, a finite supply, but infinite amount of speculators and therefore there's no, there's no price stability, right? Or it's not anchored or anything. That, that is a problem. Uh, I know some people, uh, you know, one, one of the roles I'm, I'm on now is I'm on the board of INSEAF, which is under Bank Negara, uh, which is the Islamic Finance University, right? So, so if you look back into monetary history, in fact, uh, this year, 2021 is the 50th anniversary. In 1971, Richard Nixon took the US dollar off the gold standard, Right? So it's, it's the 50th anniversary of the of the US free floating their currency, which, which did a, a few things. Uh, one of it is that you know you can print money uh, because you're no longer anchored to, to dollars. So at one time the French were asking where's my gold? The gold was in Fort Knox and you know not sure where, where the, <laughs> the gold whether they got enough gold or not because the US was you know being drained by by the seventies, you know, loss of productivity, but also uh, Vietnam War. Uh, this was draining their coffers, right? So, so, uh, so, so some people are looking at anchoring, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a, a, a currency, a cryptocurrency based on something. For example, the price of gold, right? Uh, then, of course, no excitement, lah, you know, because then you might as well go and buy gold through. Uh, on the other hand, gold has certain disadvantages, dif- difficult to, to divide, to carry, you know, as a store of value, as a means of transaction and exchange. So, so to my mind, uh, in its current form, you know, I, I, I have not put my own money into cryptos. Maybe I should have, but on the other hand, you know, as I say, interesting, but but it's not uh, something I'm comfortable with. I think it's too open speculation. Uh, I think the, um, you know, between various asset classes, equity, in, you, you would think will continue to do well 
you know, if you believe that the low interest rate environment we, we, we discussed earlier is very difficult to get out of, you know there's something not right. On the other hand, what the hell do you do? The proverbial genie is already out of the bottle, right? All that liquidity. How do you put that back in? Uh, in my, you know, two, three years away, I've been in my sabbatical, I've been reading a bit. So in history, actually, uh, a lot of that liquidity is in the form of debt, right? So, so the debt industry creates, you know, debt and then debt on top of debt, etc. Historically, what is done is actually what is called a debt jubilee. Eh? So the king wakes up one day and decides on his birthday, whatever, to, to free all the debt slaves. It's called a debt jubilee lah, because debt basically resets society up to a point eh? and creates a certain period of calm until debt builds up again. Eh? So, so I don't think that's going to happen. They tried to do this in some African countries, for example, the the highly indebted countries, you know, the kind of uh, debt uh, forgiveness programs, right? So so if you believe that, that those kind of monetary conditions are not going to change for a while, it will take a while. In fact, it's probably going to be harder than even the very difficult carbon uh, to net zero transition is difficult to begin with. Eh? You know, to, to reverse this kind of uh, monetary policy is in some ways more difficult, uh, you know, because nature has a self-healing kind of a process eh, if you think about it but but not necessarily in the financial world therefore uh, you know interest rates should be low of course on and off we fear about inflation a bit but because the underlying economy is still not great those those inflationary pressure won't, won't be quite there therefore asset prices and equity in particular you would have thought would continue to to be higher than usual Right, so if there's no liquidity, then you know this kind of valuation multiples will not be there, lah. Right, so you would you would think that it would still need. So I would say as an asset class, therefore, you know, uh, certainly uh, equities should continue to to thrive in that sense. Of course, then within equities, they they call it what the K recovery, right? There's a big divergence between certain type of stocks, technology, for example. Uh, but big tech, as it grows, as you can see, there's a pushback from regulations, uh, etc. And that's quite natural, you know. In the past, whether, I don't know, Standard Oil, Rockefeller, more than 100 years ago, or AT&T, etc., or Microsoft, when they grow too big, naturally, there'll be some pushback. Or indeed, now, uh, Big Pharma is, of course, raking it in with with, uh, with, the, with the vaccination and so on and so forth, right? So, so there will be some natural... Uh, checks and balance coming into the system. Uh, I think, you know, the split between developed and emerging markets, uh, that was my view. Lah. I think there will be some winners among emerging markets, those who can get their act together. So, for example, the last few years, uh, someone like Vietnam, for example, right, we can see a clear breakthrough coming through, right? But to get to where they were for that, for that relative lift-off the last two, three years, <coughs> uh, you know, it needed decades of preparation etc or even a bangladesh for example you know people always have images of like life aid you know drought and and flooding and stuff like that which they still have but you know the last few years they they've they've become you know manufacturing sector not just textiles but but pharmaceuticals for example you know they they they, they began to to do something lah. so so it is possible to reverse these things lah. So Malaysia, we had, we have that in our muscle memory actually. It's there somewhere. I think we we need to sort it out. There's a lot of you know. I, I mean, our demographics is still favourable, eh? right? So of course, there's there's issues around education, macam macam lah, a lot of things. So I don't know whether I answered your your ten year portfolio plan, <laughs> but that's then of course you know thematically within that things like green ESG. You know, you have to be careful of greenwashing and stuff like that. But, you know, but clearly there are a lot of themes and sub-themes within that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So this one takeaway from your message is that 10 years out is still going to be the traditional um, equities, um, you know, theme. And of course, uh, technology and ESG. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, w- w- one thing to note, Chong, is that, you know, equities can mean public equities, which is, of course, what we normally mean by equities. Uh, but it could also mean private equity, not necessarily the very large, you know, masters of universe kind of PE firms, your KKRs and TPGs of the world. But I think you know, there's a flowering of regional PE firms, uh, which I think are interesting. I think there's probably going to be a lot of interesting companies in the in the private equity space. 
And then venture, eh? venture is another form of equity. Uh, let alone you combine that with the with the power of uh, technology, right? You know, so so I think all all that will be quite interesting. And then you know, then the potential for partnerships, regional partnerships, right? So I think we we were already doing some of this when I was at Kazana, and indeed, you know, you talk about Chinese companies because they have to come back home or closer to home. Uh, already happening, right? So Ali came here, Tencent is already here, etc., etc. You know, so, so, so I think there will be many, many possibilities. Just that, you know, as I said, I think, uh, you know, good smart equity will be one way. Like, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical of, um, of you know, certain instruments like crypto, which is, which is open to too much volatility and speculation, like, right? Uh, unless they can tweak that, as I said. If if it's anchored on something more solid than you know like gold for example, that could be interesting. A kind of crypto dinner if you like you know something like that. That could be interesting. That could be one interesting development. Um, you know earlier you talked about how you break up small, uh, big big problems into small chunks, and then you that's how you can um, solve them along the way. Um, I like the fact that in in your slides, and we're obviously moving to a more personal element now. You have um, you have segregated life into into seven year cycles, right? So I see, and you've got a very you've got a very nice handwriting, country. So so you know obviously um, you're you're now in in the in the ninth um, well section of the seven year cycles where um, you put it to 40, 56 to sixty three years old. Still very productive, but transitioning to a stewardship um, uh, role. Uh, I know in the last few years you've traveled around the world. You've built your own websites. You've uh, you know you've taken uh, you've gone around the world seventy in seventy seven days on on seventy seven trains train rides. Um, you had a lot of time to to reflect on your journey in life. Um, Maybe you can tell me about this uh, these seven-year cycles. I mean, w- what advice can you give to people in terms of making sure that each seven-year cycle is a very productive and successful one? Successful one. Right. Uh, I mean, the the it's in first it, this reference what Chuang reference to the so-called seven-year cycle theory of uh, life's journey uh, is something I kind of picked up, but also I kind of. I suppose extrapolated it, and I've used that as a framework in all my years of um, supervising people. I was, you know, head of Kazana, and and therefore, you know, I would have, uh, you know, all your usual, not just performance evaluation, but it was really trying to figure out and help, uh, you know, those who report to you how they can be the best they can be, lah. Put it that way. So I've used this so-called seven-year cycle. Ah. Yeah, this is something I scribbled. So, so to highlight this, as a young parent, me and my wife and a few classmates sat down one evening in a, in a particular fasting month evening. Lah. So after breaking fast, praying, etc., among old friends, we invited somebody who's, um, who's kind of an expert in this field. To The topic was how to raise children. Okay. So we were young parents, so I was probably in my early 30s with a couple of kids who were like, you know, one year, three years, that kind of thing. So I thought what he gave was a very interesting framework, which covered the the, uh, the first three, lah, from zero to 21 years. I just want to share. The rest were basically my speculation, lah, which I'll share with you briefly. So this gentleman, Datuk Fadilah Kamsah, lah, so quite a popular uh, paka motivasi, lah, you know, motivational <laughs> kind of speaker, funny guy, who's also, all these were my, my MCKK punya classmates. Lah. He's also an MCKK boy, our super senior. So he said that actually, the first seven years of your life, the infant, you basically must give them a lot of love. I think this makes sense, right? So, so when we watch Netflix series, the crazy psycho killer, all this, they blame... I had a bad childhood and all that. Lah. So you, you know what that means, right? However, if your kid, you're still giving them only love in the next seven years, seven to 14, without the discipline and work ethic, you know what happens, lah. become spoiled. Lah. Manja, lah. Malay say manja, right? Problem, right? So therefore, you need to put in, obviously, work ethic, etc. Uh, for, for, for us Muslims, for example, at the age of seven, you're, you, are, you have to ask your, your child to start praying, actually. Because that creates the discipline. Eh? But if you 
if you have love and discipline, you should be able to succeed. But after that, if you hold them back too much, problem. Because they need, at, at about, you know, when they enter their teenage years, naturally they need to explore, right? Otherwise, you're too sheltered. Hence, to explore and learn. So I thought that was really good. And as I reflect back on my life, you know, you know, this makes a lot of sense, right? And as a parent, I said, wow, this makes a lot of sense. So you think more about it, but by that time, you were already around here. Lah. Then you, you think about it. The following, uh, let's call them the seven-year cycles, I think some people call it, oops, some people call it uh, chevrons, right? So, so each section or each chevron, actually 21 to 28, for most people, you've graduated, etc. You've done your learning, you're exploring, you make a few mistakes along the way, but the stakes are not very high. Lah. You can make a few mistakes. And then you get into your first job. And this one, when people ask me, my kids ask me, of course, they, they all have a mind of their own and they should. It's really don't go chasing after the, you know, the highest pay, etc. You know, in fact, the best firms don't necessarily pay the highest pay, right? Why? Because you are still learning a lot here and you need to build some very good work ethics like, you know, diligence, honesty. You got to work hard. Right, you you have to have integrity, blah blah blah. But most important is your trajectory at this stage, is you're learning a lot in your first job, lah. But later, and this is part of a so-called leadership journey, is in my view, uh, the next one, 28 to 35, you you are an emerging leader. You're also building a family. Uh, again, lah, this is a general case. Eh? There will be exceptions, uh, and really, this is about drive and upgrade. You you must have the passion, the hunger, the diligence. To, do, to be really good at something, lah, right? Because you, as I said to my guys last time, by the time you're 35, some do it earlier, lah, you really got to be the go-to person in something, lah, whatever it is. In my case, for example, I was, uh, this period, I served my time 10 years lah, in LLN Tenaga. Uh, I was lucky, Chuang, that Tenaga became the largest company on the stock exchange, got listed. And I'm, I'm the finance guy and I'm the investigation guy. So suddenly the likes of UBS and Solomon wanted someone like me. Lah. So that was my big break. But then I had to prove myself, of course, to, you know, you become head of research, etc. Right. So then I became the go to guy in the power sector or on Malaysian conglomerates or things like that. Right. Then after that, actually, whether you can you have to have the qualities of can you okay you're good at your subject matter can you be good at leading teams for example so teamwork teamwork means you know you need tolerance you need to know how to empower people can you manage through others because you can't do everything obviously right uh, so happened I became MD of Kazana at the age of 43 lah, uh, which is uh, frankly a bit of a surprise but you know I was given that that daunting task for what it's worth but this is what I call prime time one, prime time two, because I think during these years, say between 42 and 56, for most people, uh, they are, if not matured, certainly in the late stages of ma the maturing process, you tend to have a lot of energy still. You, your maturity may, 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 may not be, uh, uh, what do you call it? May, may not be 100% yet, you know, uh, so for example, uh, sometimes anger management not perfect yet. Eh? <laughs> you still you 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 your fuse very short still when you're younger. But um, my goodness, why this keep on jumping? But anyway, so you get the drift, right? Then prime time too, you get a bit more maturity. You learn to delegate, but all the time you must maintain your integrity. You must manage not just your aptitude, but your attitude. But also when you get up there, so called. How to manage your altitude. So I actually use this chart to talk through with my, my direct reports. Eh? My staff to, to, to begin. It's a, it's a tool. Uh, you know, of course, every individual will be different. But it's a tool to force you to think what it means. Lah. And this is what it meant to me in my own part of the journey. And some comments. And then, you know, as you get to... You could argue that, um, you know... It depends. Lah. I'm, I'm here right now as a so-called steward where mentoring, vision, develop others, learning, still contributing, I hope. But, you know, in terms of uh, full-time, you know, intense work, maybe that's not the case anymore because you move on to a different stage. And that is really a concept of a life journey, right? So how long that it takes, 
uh, to other as a steward to whether hopefully you attain some kind of wisdom lah. Hopefully, you know, uh, mentoring, develop others. So that's why I enjoy the role I have as a visiting fellow. I'm thinking a lot. I'm reading a lot. I'm I'm doing. In my three years away after Kazana, I counted. I've done about fifty-five uh, lectures or talks, you know, which is uh, almost two a month, lah. Which or actually about one and a half a month kind of thing, lah. You know, that that kind of ratio, which is about right, and so on, lah. You know, so so it's a framework, lah, Chong, for what it's worth. So, so life is, uh, you know, a bit cliche, but it is indeed a journey. And at each for any journey, you need a bit of a map, lah. So this is. This is a kind of map or tool that I try to share, lah. And I think it seems to resonate when uh, when people invite me to speak. When I show this, I don't know. People seem to resonate that you you you're able to think and plan. And also, you know, a key underlying point is that, uh, you know, at different stages, it's different, right? You have different priorities, right? So obviously, when you are when you are raising a family. Uh, you know, you you have to make sure that you know find you you need a certain kind of financial base to support the family, etc. But when you reach another stage of your journey, uh, it's a bit different, right? And people do go through this this um, these changes, right? So yeah, I, I'm always impressed by um, the systematic way in which high achievers like yourself are able to categorize and to meet each milestone of life as they come by because obviously when I look at your your timeline Tan Sri, each one of them has been uh, anchored by outstanding achievements whether it's head of research or on or becoming the head honcho at LLN being being headhunted and then obviously head of Kazana at just 43 years old very young um, for, for people though who don't have that ability right that intellectual ability or the um, fortune of circumstance to do well how do you advise them? Because not everybody, you know, does as well in life as they want to, you know. Especially now when COVID has rendered a lot of people's ambitions um, futile and there's a lot of mental distress in the system. You know, what kind of advice can you give to people? Yeah, I don't know about advice and actually, you know, I, I would... Uh yeah, my, my house is in front of the... <laughs> no, I would say... From, from your statement just now, Chuang, not necessarily all this was smooth sailing. Eh? So this is illustration. Eh? They were not all necessarily, what do you call it, trajectory is smooth. Definitely not. For example, alamak, the, sorry. For example, uh, my first job. So, so I took a scholarship. So therefore, I had a 10-year bond, right? Now, frankly, not many, lah, but some people... Not good lah. They don't pay off their bonds, right? Sometimes the bond you could argue was a bit too long. Ten years is very long. When I was in a position later at Kazana, I changed that. I said ten years is too long. I said for every one year you take a Kazana scholarship, you have to serve two years lah. To be fair, right, to the country. So you take a three year result, you have to serve six years. You take say masters one year, you have to serve two years. But I also made the point that your 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 service need not be immediately and it need not be continuous of course by by mutual agreement so for example a person who graduates does well in the uk a very top university or the us uh, we may not be able to offer in malaysia a suitable job that uh, you know was commensurate with this person's qualification and actually his or hers you know bubbling kind of energy and enthusiasm at that time right so we said, okay, if you're able to find a job, and sometimes we help them, you know, with a good firm, you know, a good strategy consultant or a good investment bank, etc., you know, or indeed work in a lab, uh, a scientific lab, uh, you know, that is very good. So these are very valuable opportunities. We said, it's okay, with our blessing you go, but remember, you still have to serve two years. At some point in the next, you know, five years or ten years or whatever time frame we agree on. So, so in other words, it's a more bespoke, flexible system. So for me, when I came back, uh, frankly, it was tough because it took, and this was not easy at all. I was not head honcho of, Kazana, of uh, Tenaga. In fact, uh, it took me, I think, about nine years, uh, Chuang, to get my first promotion, okay? Because Tenaga <laughs> LLN was that. Lah. It was very hierarchical. You had to wait for somebody to retire or to die before you can 
or, or new post which is very rare lah, to be created right it's okay I'm not complaining that's just what it was but during that period actually you know I, I of course I got lucky as I said when Tenaga got listed so that opened up a lot of opportunities but before that you know so on my own I would I would do whatever lah, you know, you know uh, for example I had to do management accounts so to do management accounts you can do a very simple job and go home or you try your best to understand the drivers of the management accounts for example oil oil was a you know energy prices were a big thing for 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 tenaga lah. still is right input cost now got ipp but still is so at that time i would go and learn from whoever the head of uh, the, the the oil team and very humbly just learn I'm not an engineer. I go up and learn from uh, Mr. Wong. You know, I used to just play tennis with him just to learn from him about, you know, how does transmission systems happen so that when power system goes out, you you you, you pick up. At that time, you were literally in the dungeon in general ledgers. You don't know. So so my point is, you make your own luck, lah. So when suddenly Tenaga got listed, so I became the go-to guy, lah, because I'm the guy who knows all the need. You know, at that time when you get a report by say Goldman Sachs on oil or whatever. You read it cover to cover because it was so rare. You just you don't, you don't have access to these things, right? So you make your own luck, I would say. Then later, if I may, when when I was at uh, UBS Solomon, I first the the crisis came in, right? The 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 Asian financial crisis, which which was for people who are equity analysts. This is tough because suddenly capital controls. There was no equity trading or very little, right? So suddenly all dried up, but you convert yourself into a fixed income analyst uh, as an example. So what's going to happen to Renong bonds, for example, right? Or, or, or Sunway punya bonds and, and you know, or, 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 or TRI punya convertible bonds. Suddenly people from the distress uh, trading team wanted to know. And of course, we became advisors at Solomon to government of Malaysia during the financial crisis. So that helped. Uh, you know, so suddenly all these things opened up again. So my, my my message would be, be prepared. You know, don't don't worry too much and do the right things. Do it in the right way. Uh, God willing, inshallah, your break will come sooner or later. That, that's my view, of course. But in my case, actually, after a while, I I felt hmm, there's more to this. So I gave up a uh, rather you know one of the best jobs in town, right? So you were head of research of Solomon Smith Bunny, financial advisor to government of Malaysia, you know, earning a lot of money uh, for that time, lah. Uh, thank God for that. But I said I gave them one year notice. I said I need there's more to life than finance, etc. So I went off uh, to a sabbatical, took my whole family, went to UK, you know, did my masters at Cambridge. At that time, I really didn't know what what next, right? But so happened I landed up in development and development economics looking at the cross-section between state and markets for example a lot of stuff later this is to be honest perfect training ground for for the the job that was coming which was as Kazana MD because that's basically what you do and after I left Kazana that's why I'm particularly you know thankful my old uh, faculty so the the center of development studies where, where I did my masters uh, you know gave me a distinguished fellowship to, to do and I, I'm, I've since been there working with uh, Dr. Hajun Chang, you know, famous development economist. He's from Korea, thinking through and then, you know, gave me a chance to write a bit and, you know, do lectures, etc. So my point is actually like Tenaga, for example, 10 years after I left, I came back as major shareholder and on the board. Eh? You know, so all these things you can't predict, lah, you know, uh, Chuang. But, but I, I would challenge and submit that each and every one of you, uh, yeah, I know there's a lot of stress in the system right now. Don't give up. I think you there's many many things we can't control. In fact, a huge number of things we can't control. But there's always things that you can control within you. So, for example, you know, I never heard of CFA. But when Tenaga got listed, actually, suddenly, wow, all these fellows coming in, you know, with the, the, the three alphabet CFA. So I was curious, what the hell is this CFA? Then they tell me, do CFA. You can, your, your gaji will go up a lot. I said, oh, okay, okay, that sounds good. Because for me, necessity is a lot. Just got a new baby, right? Just got married, got new baby, scratching my head. My wife, uh, you know, my dear wife who has been, you know, fantastic. Of course, we've been married almost. Uh, we're in our 30th year of marriage, lah. thank God for that. She was an architect. 
she was earning more than me, you know, when we first got married. Uh, good of her. She she gave up her job lah when once we had our second child. But that forced me. I said I really need to upgrade, do CFA. In fact, you know, to highlight the the two people because you do CFA, two people got to sign you in lah. So one of them is my dear friend uh, Theo Coughlin. You may know Coughlin, long time kaki lah. So Coughlin was with Bearings lah, the big the big house uh, on on the street at that time, right before. Before Nick listened, so bearings literally the bearing after that lah, they 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 fell down. So Coughlin was one, and the other was Ama Gill. Ama went on to C C L S A because they were both analysts, you know, covering tenaga and so on. So so I did that, finished that. Uh, so so this notion of constantly upgrading yourself lah. So now, for example, I'm 60. I'm at this stage. I'm not just um, teaching or writing whatever. No, I I'm actually learning. I'm I'm, I'm You know, I'm seriously trying to, you know, you saw my library. I, you know, thank God lah, I got time lah because otherwise a lot of these books are just sitting there. But you know, I'm I'm trying to read and learn new things, right? So which I think so. So that's life's journey, right? You you basically don't know exactly when, but you know 100% for sure if you're prepared, you work hard, you will get lucky. Yeah, this is basically my view. Yeah, I think it was the famous South African golfer from the. I think 70s and 80s. I think his name was Gary Player. He said famously that、uh, he found that the harder he worked, the luckier he got. And obviously, you can't get away from the old principles of hard work, discipline, motivation, being versatile, and、uh, to be resilient because you know things are never the never as easy as you think they should be.、Um, you also, I I noticed from from your slides, you've also always had.、Um, A fondness for travel, which you could never do because you're always working so hard at Kazana. And you know, I've 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 covered your your journey for many years, Tanshu. Your work ethic was legendary. So many people who told me they would have meetings with you at two in the morning, three in the morning, four in the morning, and people would say that this Tanshu Azman he never never sleeps one. So it it must have been very hard for you to to hold back your passion for travel while you were the, in your corporate years. But then in the three years that you've left since then. You managed to go around the world, seventy-seven train rides in in seventy-seven days. That must have been amazing, 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 amazing. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Thank you for for me for the for that、uh, Sejue、uh, Chuang. No, first of all, the the so-called legends or or, or 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 stories about our work ethic. Some of it exaggerated lah, to to be honest. But some of it is true. And it was also not the whole fourteen years, lah. So initially, as I tried to highlight in that seven year cycle slide, initially you are younger, you are, you know, you 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 don't have that much experience actually, honestly, earlier. But you have a lot of energy, right? You have more energy.、Uh, you have to be careful because you have to balance with your home life, you know. Because if you don't have an understanding family, then susah lah. That that work life balance. Uh, which is something I track by the way, and I think thank God lah, most of my colleagues were okay lah. We didn't, we didn't have high divorce rates, etc. You know, this is very important because the wholesomeness of things is is an important part of the whole journey, yeah. Which、uh, I think is captured in the、um, in the CIMB speech lah for those interested. But yeah, I think one one of the things that to my mind is、uh, very dear to my heart and for many people, and indeed affected by lockdown, is this thing. Call wonder last, right? Right. So the urge to travel and visit places, you know, see see how other people live, etc., etc. Because in looking at the other, you also define yourself, lah. You 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 kind of discover more about yourself. So, so I'm glad you highlighted. And this is、uh, my private website, lah. But anyway, so we talk about wonder last. And actually, I was lucky enough that in 2019,、uh, I managed to do. In the summer of 2019, for 77 days, as you said, I managed to do a trip around the world just by taking trains and a few other modes. Ah, unavoidably, I had to take one, a few aeroplanes. But by and large, from Kajang, where I live, I managed to go to Los Angeles without flying. Ah,、eh? so can you imagine? You go through this one. You even cross the ocean from、um, from Southampton to New York by ship.、Uh, but before that, trains, etc. Lah. For 77 days, but from LA to New Zealand, I had to fly lah. I couldn't find within the time I had a, a, a ship that would take me. But this trip, actually, I've been dreaming about for a good part of about 40 years. 
because in uh, around about 1980, I think I read a book called The Great Railway Bazaar. If you Google it out, there's a guy called Paul Ferro, quite a famous travel writer. He wrote The Great Railway Bazaar. Lah. He basically went from London to China and back. Lah. So he went via uh, the likes of Iran and India, went through Malaysia as well, by the way, and then went up to China. And then from China, he went up uh, through Mongolia, through the Trans-Siberian, back into Europe. Lah. So I remember reading it when I was 19 years old. I said, wow, this is amazing. I would like to do this. Lah. Uh, so to do this kind of trip, you basically need... Um, uh, let me just... Uh, you, you basically need a few factors. Lah. So this one I'm sharing some screen. Uh, this is from my whatever my record of the trip. So the dots are actually where, we, where, where I went. Lah. Right? So I started in Kajang, as I said. And then went up north to... Um, to Bangkok eventually, into Cambodia, into Vietnam, into southern China, got ourselves to Tibet, cross China, you know, skirt the Gobi Desert, Beijing, into Mongolia, into Trans-Siberia, into Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, Helsinki, and then go down Europe to Venice and then take the, the, uh, the Orion Express to, to London, which is actually a halfway point. Interestingly, in London, we had a nice lunch some friends hosted at the Reform Club. You know, the Reform Club is from the scene in... Uh, Paspatu. Paspatu. Paspatu, correct. Paspatu and uh, the yes, Jules Verne right. book. Uh, you know, they, they, they did the bet, the around wager, the around the 80 days. Lah. So it was actually held there. And then we crossed the ocean by Queen Mary, which is the Cunard Line. Eh? Used to be the Titanic. New York. Uh, Washington DC, Detroit, uh, Chicago, etc. into West Coast and then come through New Zealand, cross Australia by train uh, and then fly to Bali, Jakarta. Lah. So sat down with some friends, took the train to Bandung, Singapore, met small friends and then cross the causeway and then back into Johor Bahru, Gemas, back to Kajang. Lah. 77 days, 77 trains. So each part ada ada ni lah ada what do you call it uh, you know for example this is Venice <laughs> so if you look here that's that, that's me in a sarong <laughs> on the Grand uh, Grand Canal right so some friends stand out lah yes. this this are these are architects Nani Peter they are architects every oh, year. I know you know Nani? Okay, so Nani, you know, we worked yeah, together okay. on some projects. So, so happened they were in town. La. They, they, they came for the uh, 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 Art Biennale. La. So that's Venice and Rizwa, another architect friend. Uh, this is the welcome committee. La, when we, that's my wife when we arrived in, uh, in uh, Venice. And uh, so, not bad. La. This one looks like... Um, this is Fantastic. the this is a George Clooney moment lah. This is got to dress up a bit about yes. about to go for the uh, for the what they call it the Orion Express. Uh, actually, I sent for my tuxedo to come from KL. It didn't come in time. Bloody DHL Italy stuck lah. Those guys don't work weekend something like that lah. So so I had to go to a to a tailor to get me dressed out lah so that I can bought the what do you call it the Orion Express huh? Orion Express you got to dress out a bit huh? uh, you know and this is part of the art Biennale so yeah I think the the um, the uh, then then you take the Orion Express so yeah I think it's uh, I was about to say to do this you need the idea you need the you need uh, the time you need the health you need some money, but you know, actually, like Orion Express is expensive, lah. But you know, some of the others are very basic, very cheap. You know, trains through through uh, Southeast Asia, for example, very very cheap. Uh, through America, also the trains are not expensive. Uh, but you also need the the world to be open, so you can't do this trip today. So in that sense, I was lucky. Eh? This was the last summer when the world was still open. And you know, so this when I arrived in London, uh, this is the cab driver, Chelsea supporter, la. otherwise he's a nice guy. He took me home. Then your Spurs, right? I'm a Tottenham man. La. 
So you know this is this is nice lah. So you make some good friends. Uh, yeah. So this is. <laughs> Uh, but you know, but there were also all kinds of parts of the journey, lah, right? Um, ah, this is from the Reform Club. So yeah, so I, I was lucky, and then in many ways, you know, I was very grateful to be able to do this trip. Uh, this, for example, is a uh, is our lunch. You can reassure you in awful places. A far cry from the anxious sweats of doom of doom airplanes inspired or the nauseating gas sickness of the long-distance bus, or the paralysis that afflicts the car passenger. If a train is large and comfortable, you don't even need a destination. A corner seat is enough, and you can be one of those travelers who stay in motion, straddling the tracks, and never arrive or feel they ought to. Like that lucky man who lives on Italian railways because he is retired and has a free pass. <laughs> Yeah, that was reading from um, from the uh, Great Railway Bazaar at the Reform Club, right? It was actually hosted by this friend. She, she's Malaysian, uh, Puma, Puma Kimis. She's a member of the Reform Club. Uh, she hosted this lunch. And here she is reading from Jules Verne's uh, Around the World in 80 Days in the original French. Eh? And this copy is actually from the Reform Club uh, Punya Library. So you just, just look at this. Phileas Fogg. Phileas Fogg. Avec quitté sa maison de Saville Row à 11h30 et après avoir, avoir placé 575 fois son pied droit devant son pied gauche et 576 fois son pied gauche. Okay, I, I don't understand all that, but you know, you get the drift, lah. and then and so on. Lah. So anyway, yeah. you, you've you gone through all that. So so part of my lockdown project was just to build this private website, lah, just, just to write and from my Instagram account. So for example, this is from the uh, Queen Mary. So interestingly, the, the Metra D and the Queen Mary, Kelvin is from uh, Miri, Sarawak. <laughs> You know, so which is which is nice, right? And uh, what do you call it? The so, so that was a nice surprise. And the uh, the chef is from Bangi, round around the corner from where I live. <laughs> so that's him. So so chef uh, chef Hassan, they call him. He's from Bangi. You know, and then the girl in the front, uh, whatever is uh, is uh, is from uh, Faith is from Klang. So we actually had a national day lunch. This is 31st August. <laughs> they prepared a special Brilliant. makan for us on the Queen Mary. Eh? This is Dato Anthony Cooper, a friend of Malaysia and his wife. Uh, he was celebrating his 80th birthday. So not bad. Eh? So this was like, you know, they did a special lunch with, uh, with I can show you the menu. Got, got satay and nasi lemak and whatever. And this is like the Atlantic Ocean out there, right? So... So uh, yeah, there you go, <laughs> and that's the chef. Wow. You know, so so we had, you know, honestly, I'm I'm so, um, and you know, and then you you arrive in New York after that, and New York is New York, you know. I love New York, of course. <laughs> and actually, our daughter, our youngest daughter, Tasnim, uh, coincidentally, when we arrived, she just started one week. Uh, she's then, I mean, at Columbia, right? So she got into Columbia uh, University. So, you know, we were there as parents, but also, you know, lah, there's a lot to, to do in New York. Uh, trains, museums. Uh, this is this is a Malaysian restaurant, John Pang, a Malaysian, and he was at Columbia, and his wife, Naoko, was teaching there. Uh, you know, that's Washington Square, and so on. Lah. So... So imagine you're, you're able to do all that. Uh, I'm very thankful. So, so this is actually quite interesting. We were in downtown New York. So on Uber, you, you call for a car. Suddenly, car comes in front of you with the number plate Mahade. Okay, I'm not joking. <laughs> I don't know. That's why we were like, whoa, what's going on here? But, you know, we were... Uh, this is the artist Zaki Anwar and Suryani, his wife. Uh, he was having an exhibition in New York. Which was nice, uh, you know. And this is the train. This is the famous vessel. 
But uh, this one actually, apparently it was uh, UN General Assembly. So Tone was Prime Minister. And I think apparently the the limo firm or something like that bought that number plate. Lah. That's what I was told later. So I don't know. But uh, yeah, the... But, you know, but I also, you know, did a bit of work, I suppose, in the sense that, you know, these are among the people I met, you know, New York, Boston, uh, this is the dean of the Kennedy School at Harvard. That's uh, Gillian Tad, eh? famous journalist, Gillian of the FT. Oh, yeah, the FT, special times, yeah. So, and old friends, as I said, my interest in terms of um, ESG and impact investing, etc., she, she chat my session you know in in davos eh, many years ago on uh, on impact investing like that time nobody had heard of impact investing this guy is anthony viscogliosi uh, a venture capitalist i'm actually on his board now i joined with one of my commercial things eh. so the you know his firm does uh, investing in biotech and life sciences as a venture capital so so this was the the lunch we had that he invited me to join his board lah. Later, I joined. Uh, this is a group that works. Uh, Sarah is with uh, what they call financing capital for the long term. So people like Larry Fink is in there, and and from this group, actually, you know, his famous letter, shareholders' letter, started there. This is Scott Kelp. Scott was the number two at the Korea Investment Corporation, so SWF, right? So we used to meet in Davos a lot. We were both ex colleagues from Solomon. So had nice makan with him and Peggy, uh, his wife, and Scott is running SWF work, so I'm kind of involved a little bit. That's Dr. Ricardo Hausman at Harvard, famous development economist, you know, and, and other friends. So this is with the World Economic Forum. I'm, I'm on their global future. So, so part of your, your work you're able to do, and this is... Actually, uh, interestingly, um, Gillian's article was just coming out. So she gave me a sneak preview. Capitalism, a new dawn. She talks about... So imagine, the f- just now we were talking about financialization. So even the biggest cheerleader of finance is now talking about stakeholder capitalism, okay? So I never thought I'll see this in my lifetime. Uh, but we must be careful. Uh, I think capitalism has done a lot. We mustn't uh, miss that. Of course, New York, uh, you know, catch some plays, some theater, and how we miss that from um, from what do you call it? Now under lockdown, right? So a lot going on, lah. So this is, of course, train journey must go to Grand Central, lah. So this is the famous Grand Central station, and so on, lah, and so on. So um, you know, at the moment, this is a private website, but you know, if people are interested, can I suppose I can consider, lah. And then actually our our another our third kid Zayed is in uh, Washington DC actually so to highlight um, of course uh, so our son Zayed was in Georgetown so so my wife followed me for about two thirds of the way eh? but after seeing her two kids she said bye bye after that I was on my own <laughs> she left me she went home <laughs> So Zayed was in, uh, now he's graduated already. So these are old kakis. Lah. For example, uh, those on your call who may know from the 90s, he's a famous fund manager, lah, Steve Diamond, an old friend. Uh, he's from the firm Emerging Market Investors at that time. So in fact, his boss uh, was the one who coined the term Emerging Markets, right? So, so he's, he's now a venture capitalist. Uh, you know, uh, and so on, and so on. So these are ah, these are old friends, couple of uh, economists from the IMF, Reda and Fuad. I think their their work on industrial policy is very interesting. So you you know, of course, no trip to DC is complete without visiting the various nila, the various. Uh, for example, I thought this was quite interesting. This is the Jefferson Memorial. So my comment is. Jefferson Memorial was under repair lah. This was during the time of Trump lah. That I thought was quite symbolic that <laughs> some of their famous memorials were under repair. Uh, anyway, I should I could go on and on, but you know that's basically what I was able to do in the summer of uh, 2019. For example, this is quite special when you visit the um, the Martin Luther King Memorial at midnight. It's a very very it's a very special place lah. 
So this was from a midnight uh, trip from from a block of uh, rock. Basically, they created a monument, lah. So anyway, no, I could go on. I should I should stop there. There's 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 a lot to cover. And then from there, actually, yeah, it's, yeah, just one more, one more. From from uh, DC, as I said, my wife left, so I went to Detroit because I really wanted to see this city. Because this is one city we talk about finance and society. They went bankrupt, right? After the after the Lehman crisis, so the U.S. TARP program, for example, instead of helping cities like Detroit, it basically went to a lot of bailouts on Wall Street, etc. Right? So these guys. Though uh, they're trying to come back, lah. So this, for example, uh, these are some of the local industries. There's a brand called Shinola, right? So this is very, very hipster, lah. You know, but they're trying to come back. But we also walk around to see, uh, you know, this is culturally a very interesting city, R&B. So this guy is a cab driver who used to be a drug pusher. So he took me around. <laughs> Somebody I met at the train station. And the houses are falling apart, but yet I, I went around with this guy who's an architect, very successful architect, but he's reviving large parts of Detroit, right? Uh, so, so it's a privilege, lah, Chuang, to to be able to see the world at ground level, right? So, can you imagine? Uh, then later, of course, Chicago crossing and so on, lah. So, anyway, I should stop, lah. There's a lot there. Yeah, truly a life well lived, lah. And the story still it goes on with with you, because you know you you've got a long more to go. Hopefully, one day you make your website um, available to everybody. <clears throat> but I I guess when when people go traveling, and they are a little bit further away from the you know the minutia of Malaysia and all our little you know occurrences and and issues that we got to deal with, you know we've got time to reflect and we've got time to look back on our country and our people and and to get. You know, to get a bit um, to ruminate on our issues, right? I'm sure that when you're away for over two months, you would have been able to look at Malaysia from a distance, and I guess it's a parting shot. Um, you know, you would have felt all kinds of emotions and and reached certain conclusions about our country and our future and our place in the world. W- what are some of the conclusions that you reached, Tansri? And um, you know, obviously, you, as you say, Malaysia's only been around 64 years um, as an independent country. We are but mere saplings in, in the larger scheme of things when you compare to the UK and so on. You know, what, what kind of conclusions did you reach about Malaysia, you know, as a little parting shot to, to people who are, you know, consuming this podcast? No, honestly, my, my you know, of course, bit of a cliche, I think, you know, like a lot of people, I'm naturally an optimist. Or certainly not a pessimist, but maybe a better way to put it is, you know, I think we all should be optimists, but also realists. In other words, we, we cannot be just simply optimists without looking at reality, right? So there are obviously some major challenges and we spoke about them already, you know, structural, etc. But let's not forget, is the glass half full or half empty or indeed, I would, I would submit maybe not three quarters. Lah. We were once three quarters full. Currently, maybe we are two-thirds full, but I don't think we're even, you know, half full in that sense, of course. Uh, so, so that's my first point, like, if I may. I think we, we, we need to get our act together, no doubt. And and those to those who've been given power and position and authority and given more in whatever various levels, yeah, everybody's got to gotta do their part, right? To, to those who are given more, of course, more and more is expected of you. Uh, so for me, you know, I will continue to try and contribute wherever I can. As I said, I'm, I'm doing stuff at universities. I'm on several national council, although not not uh, full time, right? It's not executive. I'm doing some of my work internationally, you know, affiliations, etc. I'm, you know, uh, I'm also I forgot to mention I'm i I've I've taken up the invitation from Tan Sri Kosukun and Tan Sri Andrew Sheng. I'm on the Wawasan uh, Education Foundation, eh? which which owns the Wawasan Open University in Penang, etc. You know, a, a place I, you know, I've always had a good a good uh, feeling with and for. So all these things we we all need to contribute wherever we can. If you think about it, if you think about the the challenges we kind of highlighted just now, right? We need to overcome. What what are the among the positives I think we have? Uh, let's take uh, history. For the start, as I said, even in that short 64 years, 
you can make a case that we've been able to overcome. Eh? Uh, you know, uh, as I said, you know, independence, the challenge of that, post-colonial, 69, the challenge of that, right? And then the 86 crisis, in, the, in between you had the whole communist insurgency, right? You can't have that kind of thing now. We see CNN, people will know like, nowadays. At that time, you actually had a war in our jungles, right? In Sabah, Sarawak, in Sarawak and in Peninsula, right? So we overcame that. Uh, we overcame, you know, 85, the Plaza Accord, you know, suddenly our loans, yen loans went like crazy. We overcame all that. 98, big crisis, right? Uh, you know, part of my journey at Kazana, okay, we did what we did, you know, thank God, you know, uh, again, uh, all that is recorded, didn't really talk too much about it today. I think we delivered uh, financial, strategic, whatever societal contribution, we did all that, we traveled the portfolio, etc. So I think we have some history of overcoming adversity uh, as a country. Of course, there are some preconditions you need to do that, uh, but, but, but take, take heart and take pride in that, I think it's important, history. Number two, geography. We are in the right location. You know, you couldn't, you, you, you know, of course we talk about the great power rivalry, etc. But, you know, our proximity to all this region. Third is, if we can harness that well, Chuang, that diversity is obviously a strength for us, right? Uh, I think Malaysians, I believe, are in great demand all over the world. Malaysian talent, partly because I think we are, we are like almost second nature, right? We, we think in multi-dimensions because we come from a multicultural background and all that. Lah. Sure, there's... Unfortunately, silos in our society, etc. I tried whatever within my powers, you know, whether how we structure Kazana or the companies that I led, Axiata, etc. I was chairman, you know, we, we tried to, 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 to make those changes as best as we can. Uh, we continue, but certainly that diversity and that geography, I think, is, is another factor. We have a lot of natural resources. We have to manage it well. There is pressure from ESG standpoint on sectors like plantations, on sectors like, you know, uh, utilities, oil and gas, or indeed the manufacturing sector, we need to clean up and green uh, our whole thing. But that can be another engine of growth, right? Uh, yes, we need to sort out education, etc. But, you know, there is still a lot of talent, uh, a lot of enterprising people. I think the, the rather uncertain environment to me, you can take it negatively or you can take it as, okay, in a lot of this uncertainty, actually, there is room to shape things yourself, actually. And I, I saw that in the, certainly in 98, those who came out in 98, and those who came out from 86. So, so I think, uh, itulah. So I, I've highlighted how I see the next 10 years into those three horizons. But at the end of the day, I think that maybe a good place to end is, uh, there is personal agency, as they call it. It's really up to us, up to me, up to each one of us. You know to find that and then secondly there is collective agency la. collective agency means the power of collectivism la, whether through civil society or whether through institutions right so i was both uh, you know it was both a, an honor but also a, a, a big amana a big responsibility to run a major institution la, which was kazana right so for 14 years and i'm grateful for that but that but i think you you must treat that as um as a kind of platform uh, where it's basically an institution, uh, which is what I want to end on, that the power of the individual uh, to take charge of your journey uh, in order to be the best you can be, right? In the right way, do the right things in the right way. But then to translate that into the power of institutions and collectivism uh, coming together. So I think that's one way, uh, as per your podcast, uh, Chuang, to do more. Yeah, Hopefully. well, thank you, Tantri. I mean, the the story doesn't end because you've got so many more years of contribution to the country, and I think the powers that be recognize you for who you are, and um, I, I'm so chuffed that they have acknowledged that, and I think that your thoughts, your insights, your experience can really help pull us this country out of the situation. As you say, um, it is never, you know, it is always a glass half full. So, I mean, thank you for your time. It was a huge honor, huge privilege. Um, no, no, my, 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 my privilege. Thank you. So, no, no one has come bigger than you, uh, Tansri. So, so you, you no, 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 um, Good luck. Good luck with the, with the, you know, with the journey ahead for all the decades to come. And um, thank you once again for, for the time you spent with me. Thanks, so, thanks, John. Keep up the great work. <laughs>